I think this morning is really interesting because we've been on an 18 month journey at The Guardian. And um, when we started out, I wasn't really quite sure how important the project was going to be for us. But actually, it's been a great means by which we can galvanise our effort, but also actually force the organisation to really think about data and data protection. Because in fact, what we had was lots of different silos, people doing all sorts of different things and no real um, alignment, I really, about what our goals and objectives were. And as you can imagine, with The Guardian, that's really quite a tricky place to be. Before I start, though, I just wanted to comment a bit on uh, Christopher um, Graham's points, particularly this thing about enablers versus um, traffic wardens. And the reason why I asked him that question is that as far as I'm concerned, I want an enabler in my data protection compliance team. I want someone to explain to me how I can do stuff, not how I can't do stuff. And actually, I found his speech incredibly encouraging because there's lots and lots of positive information about how to help us do our jobs better. Um, you know, data protection has gone mainstream. I'm not a compliance person. I'm not a data protection expert. But I do need to know how to use data to do my job properly. Um, and also, I consider data protection to be as important and as big a responsibility for me as it is for our data protection team. And I think I'd have to say that you know, Tim and our compliance team found that quite challenging to start with, that I was that interested in it. Um, and actually, what it means is it requires us to simplify and explain stuff. And our project at The Guardian was all about simplification and explanation. We still need the privacy policy, we still need the privacy centre, we still need all the detail, but actually what I wanted was something that practitioners could understand and also something our customers and readers could understand. And then one final thing about the ICO. I, I came here last year and I listened to David Smith and the bit I remember out of his entire speech was his final words where he just said, don't piss people off. And that's it really. It's really, really simple. It's just don't piss people off. And then and you know, you know in your heart of hearts when you've pissed someone off. And I think that's what really drove the code. I mean, I was quite heavily involved with the code and all of it was about making it simpler, making it easier and not annoying people. So having it both ways, we can use big data and we can be a trusted brand. And any of you who are Guardian readers will really understand the, the challenge we've got in our organisation to be able to do that. So that's my boss, David Pemsel. And um, the thing about The Guardian is we don't have paywalls. We're likely to have paywalls. And we believe in what we've described as open journalism. And open journalism is really about creating a dialogue with our readers and our audiences so that you know, we write about stuff in an open and transparent way, but we allow a dialogue backwards and forwards. Paywalls won't work if you do that, because actually what we want to do is push those stories out into the web. And actually, as a result of that, we have 100 and I think it's now 120 million uniques every month. That's like 30 or 40 million people pe each month read The Guardian. Um, and only a third of those are in the UK now. So that's a very important part of our business. So we don't think we would have got the Edward Snowden story if we didn't operate the way we do, which is being open and transparent. Well, that clearly presents us with a bit of a problem because if we can't have paywalls and we can't sell subscriptions and advertising isn't going to get us to the point where we break even. How on earth are we going to make enough money to break even? And I guess those of you who know The Guardian well will know we've had a bit of a history of being a bit flaky about the money, and actually we've got to get a bit more grown up about it. So the importance for us is we've got to deliver strong one-to-one -one customer relationships. We're, we're an incredibly trusted brand. All the stats we've got show the level of trust, but also people want to want us to be totally open and transparent as well. The key sentence here is, in the long term, the media companies that do the best job of creating valuable relationships will be the ones that thrive in the shift from print to digital. So we're going to do our damnedest to make sure we have close and dynamic relationships with our audiences, but we're not abusing that trust either. This is actually one of our corporate charts, and really it's all about our anonymous to known strategy. What we're trying to do is find out who our audiences are, build a relationship with them and deepen those relationships. And we want to create engagement and advocacy, you know, all those kind of business words, because we want to drive volumes for advertising and we want to draw, uh, find needles in the haystack to transact with people. So some of our subscribers have fantastically high ARPAs. There's not only that many of them, but we need to find those people in amongst those 120 million uniques. Why do we think that? If we look at our signed-in users, which is one of our key strategies, 
They only make up 1% of our users right now, but actually they are 20 times more valuable than anonymous users. They have 571% more sessions, 59% more page views. They're more loyal and they're more likely to promote The Guardian. So we need to find more of those kind of people. Um, I mean, it's the kind of theme that, 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 that sort of seems to crop up over and over again is that data is everywhere. You know, all of our teams in our business now need to use data, whether it's our content team, so our editorial people, you know, we've got a new guy who started from the New York Times quite recently, Aaron Pilhofer, who absolutely loves data. He's hungry for data and information. Our product teams, in order to figure out what products to develop, um, our marketing teams, as well as the revenue teams who want to sell things. However, and there's a really, really, really big however, data's in the news a lot. The Guardian takes a very high profile editorial stance on it. And even within our own organisation, we conflate the issues around Edward Snowden with issues around collecting personal data. So it's, we, we have massive internal arguments about this thing. So can you imagine how difficult it is for consumers to understand it if we can't figure it out for ourselves? So we have to figure out how we balance privacy with understanding our customers. And I think this is why the project took so long, is that we had to really get our heads around it first. So in true Guardian fashion, we organised the working party. In fact, there was a whole bunch of working parties with many stakeholders. And on that list, you've got my boss, you've got me, head of analytics, head of CRM, the marketing director, the managing editor, the reader's editor, data protection team, information security, risk, communications and legal. And they all had a point of view and it was all a bit different. And you can imagine the legal guys were like, no, 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 I can't do anything. And then we were saying, yes, 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 we really want to talk about how we collect data. And so we learned a few things. So I'm just going to give you like three or four of the lessons we learned as we went through this exercise. First of all, data means different things to different people. That may seem self-evidently obvious, but at the time it didn't. Um, it's a minefield. We have got so much data in our business. We've probably got way too much data, but also people interpret data in different ways. And one of the things that's come out of this project is that we need to get much, much better about creating one version of the truth, which is what I, you're actually comparing like with like. We end up, everyone's got their dashboard and it's all a bit different. So we've got to get much better at being aligned about how we interpret the information that we collect. And then we also learned quite a lot of things about people's different attitudes to privacy. And I would say there's three groups here. One, the, the middle group, the data fundamentalists, there's 31% of them, who basically don't want any data collected at all. I suspect they're disproportionately represented amongst um, the editorial team and, and the data protection team at The Guardian. So that was quite a challenge. And then there's 16% who are the unconcerns. They absolutely don't care. And, and I would put my 23-year-old daughter into that category. You know, she's just left university on Facebook, simply couldn't care less about the whole data thing whenever I ask her. And then there's the 53% who are the data pragmatists, and I put myself into that category, which is if I understand why you want my data and what you're going to do with it, I might think about it. So it's all about what we described as the value exchange. And then we learned something else, which actually was very useful and helpful from our perspective, is that if we follow our own Scott Trust values, if anyone's ever bothered to look at the Guardian Media Group website, then it's owned by the Scott Trust. And they have some really clear values, and it's all about transparency and openness and integrity. And so if you just pick those values up and apply those the way we did our um, uh, audience charter, it makes complete sense. So that was actually really rather convenient. And then we produced a video. And this video is really short. It's only just over a minute and it didn't cost very much either. And we got the editorial team to help us. So in fact, the, it was the reader's editor who um, wrote the script for this video. We did a kind of business speak version. Then he turned it into language that made way more sense. And he was the one also who, who thought up the name, Why Your Data Matters to Us. We had a huge argument about the name, 20 people in a room arguing, and he was the one who sorted it. So you know, I'm going to name check Chris Elliott because he was incredible. Um, but just listen to this. It's, it's really simple and straightforward. Can we play the video, please? Why your data matters to us. Our owner, the Scott Trust, exists to secure the financial and editorial independence of The Guardian. 
Other than to cover expense, the Scott Trust takes no dividend from the business, ensuring all the profits are reinvested back into The Guardian and its award-winning journalism. One of the ways we generate revenue to safeguard our journalism for the future is by using your data. For example, when you sign into The Guardian's websites, or use cookies when you browse, to make advertising more relevant to you. This enables us to charge advertisers money, which helps us keep the website open to all, while at the same time making The Guardian and Observer's own products and services more tailored to you. We have guidelines on our website which clearly explain how you can stay in control of the data you provide to us, as well as a place where you can manage your preferences, and a team who are dedicated to keeping any data you choose to share safe and secure. To create or manage your account, visit theguardian.com forward slash your hyphen account. Um, the other thing you should know about that is, is although it took many, 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 many hours of effort to get that film together, that film actually only cost £5,000. So anybody can put together something that's simple and easy to understand, to explain to their customers why you want your data. Um, we've also got a resource centre on the website, so we've got a blog, we've got FAQs, signed it, all sorts of stuff. And actually, I wrote a blog when we launched the film. The, the, the level of nervousness amongst certain people in the business was so high that they were, they were saying to me, look, you know, I'm not sure you want to do the blog, you might get trolled, it's all going to be really difficult, it's going to be loads of comments. So there was lots and lots of nervousness. In fact, what happened is not a single comment. No one made a comment. Actually, most people have said, makes complete sense. Um, and actually, what we've now got is much clearer links between that and the Privacy Centre. So you've got a clear cascade, as someone would say, a golden thread from that high-level explanation right through to the very detailed explanation of cookies and all the other stuff. And, and I think we've got a very, very good Privacy Centre with lots of very useful in information. So we also did some research, and we did the research in order to reassure people that actually it was the right thing to do. And there was a few very interesting points that came out, which have already been raised today, but I'm going to just say them again. It's like, one, the charter's welcome. It's evidence of our inclusive strategy. It's evidence of including our audience, our readers, in the quiet dialogue. They hate ambiguity. They hate complexity. They hate legality. All that stuff means that they won't read it. So... The problem we had is no one read our privacy policy, even though it was brilliantly done. And actually what we're saying is make it nice and simple and they might be interested. The other thing is that in the charters, you'll see there, we had, two, we had three themes we wanted to talk about when we set the charter up. One was um, we give you lots of choice and personalisation and isn't it amazing you'll get the right offers. The second thing was we need your money. So, you know, give us your data. And then the third point was we'll keep everything secure. When we did the research... The most compelling point, as far as our audience was concerned, was give us your money. And they just wanted it to be straightforward and ambiguous. They found the kind of profiling piece slightly ambiguous and the security piece, they just thought, well, you should be keeping it secure anyway. It's like, why are you even mentioning it? So the practicalities of data sharing is a concern, not data safety. People only care, and I think Chris said it, they only care about data safety if you mess it up or if there's a breach. It's a hygiene factor. And personalisation can become evident. That's the other thing is you don't have to kind of have that conversation right up front. You can have a whole series of conversations with people about their data and sharing data. And then finally, and again, this has been said over and over again, it's really important that users feel they remain in control. We're doing a lot of work on our website this year. We just relaunched it as a responsive site. We're now doing a lot of work on um, the preference centre and manage my account. And actually what it will allow people to do is have much greater control over what they do and do not want, what emails they want, all of that kind of stuff. So over the next six months, we'll see lots of changes. But what you'll also see is a lot more um, reasons why you should sign in. We want people to sign in. We want their data. We're happy to explain why. If they don't want to do it, it's up to them. But we're also going to give you lots of great reasons why you should. So... Just a final point, there was a blog that came out quite soon after we launched it, actually, um, which congratulated us on our film. So we all kind of really chuffed about that. But the thing that's really important is that people are more clued up on the way their data is being used than ever before. Brands want to maintain the trust of their customers. Transparency is a must. So that's my parting shot. Thank you very much.